Hey everybody, welcome back to the Live Ultralight Podcast powered by Outdoor Vitals. Today in this episode of the podcast, we interview Mason Gravely. Mason has his own podcast called the Adventure Sports Podcast, which is phenomenal by the way, and you should definitely check out. And we'll talk about that in the episode, but Mason also is an avid adventurer. He prioritizes getting out on adventures, whether they're one night or whether they're his 66 day journey biking from Alaska down to Florida. So he's a wealth of knowledge. There's a lot of fun stories in here. Uh, There's a lot of really good takeaways in here. So make sure to listen to this entire episode and enjoy the heck out of it. Now, this episode was a little bit shorter than I would have hoped we could have made it. So we are going to have to bring him back on for part two. And if you've got any thoughts on questions we should ask him, make sure to reach out to us at uh, liveultralightpodcast at gmail.com or drop a comment on our YouTube channel where you can also listen or watch this episode. Now, if you are new to the Live Ultralight Podcast, this podcast is all about getting you outdoors more comfortably, more confidently, and I would say more frequently. So if that sounds like you, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. With that, we'll let you guys dive into this interview with Mason Gravely. All right, Mason, I'm super excited to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Doing great. Tayson uh, rem- rhymes with my name, so I'll, I'll remember that. I, I was actually going to say, um, you know, we don't know each other <laughs> yet, but uh, I feel like we're, we, we're bonded a little bit because half of my life I've been called Mason. Uh, oh, Mason, really? Jason, Tyson. You know, it really wasn't until Taysom Hill uh, got famous that people started to call me Taysom. And then it was like, okay, that's way closer than Tyson. So I'll take Taysom. But, <laughs> but anyways, I feel a little connected to you, like almost like we share the same name. <laughs> I, you know, I've never been called Tayson. So uh, I don't know <laughs> what that's like, but uh, yeah. I can imagine. Mason's probably slightly more common than Tayson. I don't think I've ever seen that name actually. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a made up uh, Utah name, but uh, I like it. So <laughs> when you but, run hey, out of I'm, names for your kids, you got to just start thinking of stuff. <laughs> that's right. And and then when your friends all have a million kids too, it's like, well, we can't name them any of these. And um, yeah, you start getting real, real creative here. Yeah. You got to get creative. So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm excited. Well, that, you yeah. run a phenomenal podcast. Um, you have amazing interviewees. Uh, but you yourself also are a big time adventurer. So your, your podcast is Adventure Sports Podcast. And um, just listening through some of that and some of the work you've put out there, you've you've been on some pretty crazy trips, like one of which uh, was your, your bike, I, I don't know if it was bike packing or just biking down from Alaska. But I'd love to hear maybe a little bit just to get to know you and what kind of an adventurer you are. I'd love you maybe to just pick one of those stories one of your highlights, adventure highlights of your life and, and maybe walk us through what, what it was and, and what it turned out, how it turned out. Oh man. Well, you know, I know we've already introduced ourselves, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Let me know. Uh, this is a huge honor too. I love being on a podcast. I'll, I don't know about you, but I don't get the chance to often share. Um, my show, right. it's a lot of, I interview the person. It's very much about their story. I do interject personal stuff, but I I try to keep that out of it. So I don't get the chance to kind of really share my thoughts all that often. So this is like a fun turn of the table. I didn't have to do the research. I didn't have to do all that stuff. I just like, I show up, here I am, let's talk. So this is a great break. Um, Yeah, we're about, gosh, 920 episodes in. Uh, All those interviews with different adventures, very few of those have been monologues where I just talk, maybe a handful. Um, one recently about money, like how to pay for your adventure. But yeah, all this started back in, uh, I guess, 2010, 2011, when I was in college, my roommate and I had the crazy idea to do something that summer. He was graduating. I still had a couple years left and we were, you know, born and raised in Florida. Both of us, Florida boys, him in Orlando, me more in a, a rural setting, kind of out in the woods, out in the orange groves. I spent my life camping and fishing and hunting and all, all that stuff uh, with my dad and just living out out in kind of a rural rural town. Um, but I hadn't, hadn't done anything really crazy, and my friend Paul hadn't done any of that. He grew up in Orlando uh, in town, never had been camping or anything like that. And we came across this article in uh, National Geographic where these two uh, British guys had these, – these school kids, really, friends in school had – 
by human power gone from the magnetic North Pole to the magnetic South Pole, which, by the way, shift a lot, like as far as like they move around a decent amount. I think something like 50 kilometers a year they move, which is crazy. Um, But it is not the true North and South Pole. They're out in the oceans. But still, it's a heck of a experience to try to get from one to the other by human power. They did biking and rollerblading and kayaking and sailboats, and (laughs) we were so inspired by that. Um, Unfortunately, one of them passed away a few years later uh, in a mountaineering accident, I think in the Himalayas. Don't quote me on that. Um, But we were really inspired by that story. They were both like 18, 19 years old. We said, hey, we're like around that age, 20 years old. Like, what do we do? Let's do something this summer. Um, And we thought, what's the craziest thing we can do? Let's do the Appalachian Trail. And I'm like, I don't know. We don't, I don't know if we have enough time. And again, we are complete, com- know nothing about this world. So the way we we're even talking about it at the time was completely wrong. Um, but, but we did think like, I don't know, how long does it take to walk from Maine to Georgia? We, we weren't even sure where the Appalachian Trail was, I don't even think. <laughs> and we were just talking through ideas. Maybe we could walk across the U.S. And we're like, what about biking? Biking would be a little faster and we could probably carry everything, uh, totally unaware something called bike packing or bike touring existed. And we're like, hey, let's see if we can go as far away as we can from home and bike back. And the idea in this 10-minute conversation ended up being, let's fly <laughs> one way to Alaska, get bikes, and bike all the way home to Florida, Lakeland, Florida. And this was around Christmas break. We had you know May to get ready for it. No money. We lived in an apartment that was a couple hundred bucks. It leaked when it rained. It was just, it was a terrible, like we just were broke college kids, you know, we had nothing. And uh, that's what we did in May. Two two days after he graduated, we flew to Alaska, Fairbanks, got bikes and biked them all the way home and uh, learned a lot on the way, a lot on the way. So that yeah. was that was the first adventure. And that was probably, I'd say the most impactful as far as, where we started and where we ended up was just a dramatic change. So, oh, that's <laughs> so many great ideas just happen in a 10 minute conversation. But I love that you stuck to this one and made it happen because yeah. that's that is that is crazy. So, I, I think you maybe just said that or in a different podcast, you said that was like 6,000 miles. Is that right? It was like 52, 5,300. Yeah. So, so, how long did that take you? So we had until July, late July to get back because Paul's girlfriend was graduating from nursing school and that was when her ceremony was. So we had to get back by that point. So that gave us like 75 days or something uh, from early May, May, June, July. Yeah. Yeah. Around, no, around 70 days. And we got back in 66 days. So just under that, a few days later, he goes to her graduation. They're married now. They've been married since, I gosh, 11, 12 years now. So, um, yeah, so that that's that was our deadline, and that's what we. And then I went to school like a few weeks <laughs> after that, and I was useless the first few weeks. I was just zoned out. I couldn't even think. Um, it just changed my life to say the least. Why, I did fail why? a few classes uh, and had to retake them. So I, I actually went from completing a year in my four year degree. It turned into a five year degree because of that trip. But I wouldn't change <laughs> why, a thing. Why could you not focus? Like what? Like you're back in school. You, why didn't you, why, like what changed for you there? It was, yeah, maybe that's just me, but you go from, and I hear about this a lot. A lot of the things you experience on adventures, you realize everyone else does too. And so one of the themes is um, when you get out there doing something like this, no matter what adventure, anything that's extended. So a through hike or a bike tour or a long kayaking trip, or just like overlanding or something, you kind of, it's almost like you're slowly pulling off your civilized clothes and putting on your wild fur. Um, it takes three, four days a week, depends on the person. But you really, your mind starts to turn into like an uh, instinctual focused, where you're focused on getting food, getting water, getting shelter. And it's like if you can check those things off every day, you're really like good to go. Like anything else is just a bonus. And you, you do that kind of without thinking about it, you're doing it out of instinct and now I'm like, okay, what am I going to, I'm out of food. Where do I get food? Where do I get water? It's got to be a lot. You, you tap into that animal side of our brain and it's really freeing in a lot of ways because we don't get that chance in normal life uh, very often. 
Um, now, the, the folks of us that are privileged, of course, there's plenty of people around the world that have to think about that every single day. And I don't think they would say that it's a lot of fun. Um, but for <laughs> us to choose to go on adventure, uh, it's an amazing feeling. Um, but when you get back, it's really hard to transition back. And so when I had to start, you know, thinking about high level organic chemistry, biochemistry, and, and all the classes I was taking, I was, it was a, it was whiplash to say the least mentally. So, um, I failed a few classes cause I, cause I went from focusing on just the basics every day to now I've got to study and pay for rent and take care of all these logistics every day. So that was a hard transition. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting concept. Um, just that that idea that that we do live in just such a busy day and age that that when you go out on these adventures, um, like that's what it takes sometimes to disconnect. And and I mean, I've never been on a sixty six day adventure like that, um, but it is it is really intriguing just how much we crave that simplicity and and need to find time each and every day, you know, to, to find some of that because it is, it's, I mean, I can't imagine that's such a, a stark contrast. I imagine it also sets you up on a path of, of basically being addicted to, to that type of a feeling again. Yes. It's like any addiction, you know, it just, <laughs> you know, it, it, when it bites you, it bites you. Um, thankfully mine was, you know, had, had some positive benefits because we, with the, with uh, my early adventures, especially, they were all centered around a cause, some sort of goal fundraising. And so you could, uh, it provided a lot of benefit, not just to me, but to others. And that was a huge motivator. And that was just really, that combination of adventure and purpose is actually something to this day, I'm still a huge advocate for. We're right now doing an adventure grant that is awarding people doing adventures uh, that that have some sort of community building or community focus aspect to it. So even to this day, I try to push that message of combine your adventures with some bigger purpose. Now, if you want to do an adventure just for self growth or just to get away, hundred percent fine. That's most you know. I'd say most of my adventures these days is that focus. It's just like I I got to get away. Um, but early on, it was really cool to have those. Uh, I don't know fundraising and, and, uh, philanthropic aspects to it. Yeah. That's, that's something I've never even considered, um, like tying together for me personally, right? Like if I'm going to go backpacking or something like that, I'm just thinking about going backpacking, not necessarily how it could either benefit someone else or maybe how some of the people listening to this might be thinking of how someone else could pay for their trip or something. Right. So how, how does that, that work together? How does, how does that become a, a mutually beneficial thing for a charity and, and for you to be able to go and, and do some of these trips? That's a great question. And as someone that gets asked a lot for free things, um, there's a right and a wrong <laughs> way to go about here, it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, I, I got a sleeping bag from y'all. So it's just like, um, I get, there's a right and wrong way to go about it. And I'd say the more... These terms get thrown around a lot, so bear with me. The more just authentic it can be. So the first trip, and I'll explain. The first trip was to build an orphanage in Africa. And if you, you can ask yourself, how does biking from Alaska to Florida at all connect to an orphanage in Africa? What, what does that have to do with anything? And what, what, what it was, the summer before, I had visited Africa with a team from my school to go do some work over there. And I was blown away by one of these guys we stayed with. He had a dream of building an orphanage. And where we went in Uganda, what I've been told is you can't borrow money like you can here in the States and in a lot of Western countries. So you got to build everything as you go. Like you got to pay as you go. And that's that obviously, if you're building a house as you go, it's going to take a long time. Even here, no one can really do that unless you're very well off. Um, so you'll, you'll get like these halfway built homes uh, that will get another layer of brick put on, can make it in a little higher year after year, but there's plants growing all around. It's it, it's almost falling apart before it's done. And that's just how the landscape looks in a lot of places. And so I said, what if we came along and helped this guy raise this money? He's obviously put a lot into it already. This orphanage was like halfway built. It's like, what if we could come along and help him finish it? Um, and then I came back home with that idea. 
the adventure came together and just like the the idea was we're going to get a lot of attention for doing this, you know, theoretically. We had no idea if we would or not. Um, But we're like, what if we could direct that attention to something? Um, We're going to be going through little towns. We're going to be stopping along the way and talking to people. Let's just spread this message. And so it kind of just happened organically. um, And we raised a bunch of money. And the next summer, I did another cross-country bike ride, uh, not from Alaska, but just um, north to south of the U.S., and raised more money and then went to Africa with my best friend who I had biked with, and we finished building it. We only did so much in the week or two weeks we were there, uh, but we provided them the funding to finish. And so now I've, I've been told, I don't know this, but there's a little, not a little, there's a big picture of me and Paul with our bikes in that orphanage in, in Uganda, which is cool. We've never gone back to sea, but um, that's kind of how it happened. For everybody, it's different. And if you're backpacking, like, say, the John Muir Trail or just out in the woods, you're not going to be crossing tons of people. Um, but you, you know, with social media and with websites, you can be updating blogs. You can be telling people about it. But I, I would say it has to be something that you actually want to help, um, whether it's there's a personal connection of a family member with a certain diagnosis or the, the ones that work the best, there is, you know, it, it happens naturally. It's not forced. I have tried to help fundraise for causes that was a lot more forced and it just didn't go as well. So I've learned to let it happen. If you don't feel like you need to fundraise for something, fine. You know, that's, like I said, most of my trips these days are just the benefit of being out there and adventuring. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I want to, maybe try to connect a few dots here. So you're like, who's donating businesses, individuals, everyone. Yes. Okay. Businesses, family members. Uh, a lot of the setup is <clears throat> we'd come back afterwards and tell stories like at the rotary club in my hometown or at some churches in my hometown or at the high school I went to at the college I went to. And we'd say, Hey, if you'd like to donate, here's a link or let me know. We can, we can give it directly to this, orphanage that is a nonprofit, and uh so yeah so there, there's a lot of and, platforms you can do this on too now it's a it's a there's a big uh there's been a big shift in this in the last decade since i started doing it and you're not you're not using those funds necessarily for the trip though right like all the funds no, donated i learned that early on there, right early on we were like oh great we can fundraise some and pay for the trip and then the rest can go over people do not like doing that they do not want to pay for your vacation they want to give their they want their dollars to make an impact on the thing you're talking about um so we figured out that first trip okay you got to work your tail off to pay for your adventures the good news is biking from alaska to florida when you're in college was super cheap it was less than a thousand dollars fully inclusive <laughs> including plane ticket food we were living on like four dollars a day plane ticket was 400 bucks eat? What do you eat for four dollars a day? I mean, that's like ramen. That's like this can in my hand right now, like one one beverage a day is four. But I mean, and that's not if you're going yeah. to these guys that are have a Starbucks addiction. You know what I mean? <laughs> my my trips now are. I mean, you know, all my trips now are a lot shorter because I got kids and responsibilities. But for a three four day trip, it is still probably, I mean, less than fifty bucks. So you know, the gas to get there is probably the biggest expense. And I just pull some things from my pantry, lots of peanut butter and jellies. Lots of peanut butter tortilla wraps, cans of tuna, ramen, thing called a ramen bomb. If you ever hit, had that, it's big in backpacking. Ramen, uh, tuna is what I put in mine. Uh, dehydrated mashed potatoes and mix that all together. And I mean, on a day you're starving and it's snowing and, and you're exhausted, there's nothing that tastes better than just hot, <laughs> salty starch. Anything that's edible. <laughs> Anything um, edible, man. But yeah, you just you're not eating much. I mean, you're eating you're not eating great food. But that first trip because there was that cause and because I was so young, uh 20 and I looked like it. Uh both of us were young. People just I guess felt for us. They saw us out there. They wanted to like, "Hey, can I buy you a sandwich? Hey, you want to stay in my cabin tonight? I've got a, you know, guest house on my ranch or so many opportunities popped up, especially because we had little brochures we'd hand out with people. Because when you're on an adventure and you're crossing through towns, especially bikepacking or bike touring, you're an anomaly to everybody's day. They're like, what, is it, what are these person, these people doing? 
And they want to ask the three big questions, three big questions, is where are you coming from, where are you going, and why? And you just, you end up having way more interactions than you anticipate every day on the road. Backpacking is going to be different. If you're sea kayaking, it's going to be different. Um, some people do trips in very uh, populated places just to con- just to raise the awareness uh, of what they're doing to get more fundraising efforts. And others uh, do the opposite and commit to posting about it on social or writing about it or, ta- or committing to going on tour afterwards like a speaking engagement thing. So, yeah. Tons of different setups. But it's <sighs> – I want to circle back to food here in a second and, yeah. and draw on maybe a wealth of, of knowledge you have. But <clears throat> what, was, what was maybe just the most peculiar thing that happened on that trip? Something you didn't expect or oh. the wildest kind of – because, I mean, that's – I'm sure you had a lifetime full of adventure in 66 days, which is what gets you addicted to it, right? Like, yes. you know, it's just – it's all unique. It's all one-time experience that, that you'll remember forever. It's not like getting up and putting – you know, your, your clothes on every day. Like you can't remember what clothes you wore last week, but you'll remember every part about that 66 days. And, and so I don't know. Well, I, I'm just curious. What was there something that yeah. really s- that stuck out? You know, I, I remember what clothes I wore last week only cause I got like five shirts. <laughs> so I got to wear the same stuff. Um, so I did wear this shirt at some point last week. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question, yeah, every day was different. Every day was new. One, th- two things about adventures that I don't know if people ever really say, but this is a big part of the addiction is for a lot of us, especially when it's a new place, it's like every mile and every face is new, which means your brain is working overtime to process all this information. And what that does is it slows time down. A lot of people will talk about on an adventure that, okay, it was only a week but it felt like a month or it was two months and it felt like a year. I can honestly say it felt like a, that trip felt like a year of my time, a year in today's world, my much more routine life, uh, with a family, things just kind of blend together and you don't really realize how much time's passing by on an adventure. You're hyper aware of every moment and time just slows down. So, so much more life is packed into a short amount of time. And that's why I tell people now, don't neglect how much you can actually do on a weekend because that's about the length of my trips at this point. And it it absolutely hits the nail on the head for what I'm looking for at this stage of life, if that makes sense. Like, I know weekend warriors kind of can have a negative connotation, but you can pack so much into a Friday afternoon to a Sunday night or Monday morning. And there's this great, a great folks, uh, Jason Anton and Mike uh, Chambers, who was on, a guest on the show. They're called Beat Monday. It's like this huge challenge. It's, a, it's an outdoor TV, outside magazine. I mean, outside magazine TV show called Beat Monday. And their whole thing is fitting a ridiculous amount of things into a true weekend without taking any time off. And now they're extreme. They'll literally go international and like climb volcanoes and be back to work on Monday, leaving Friday afternoon uh, or Friday evening. Um, but they're, yeah. it's meant to show you how crazy you can do, like how crazy the things you can do on a weekend so that you can say, okay, I can go backpacking or I can go camping with my kids. And I will say like, because adventure is a... a it's newness and your brain's processing all that info and it's slowing time down. You can pack a lot into a day or two or three. So when you multiply that for 66 days, it feels like a lifetime. So the, to, an, to all this to say, to answer your question, one of the craziest <laughs> unforeseen things that happened was one, the generosity of people. That's another huge theme I hear people talk about um, how much better the world is than you realize. But a specific example is we got chased by a bison for like hours. <laughs> and yeah, this one bison in British Columbia, we chased it. Like it ran in front of us on the road for at least 10 miles. <laughs> and then it like got off the road, waited for us to pass it, and then chased us for another 10 miles. <laughs> and it was such a roller coaster of emotion and problems. And like we literally thought we were going to get trampled by this 
massive bison. It got so close to us at times. We're on our bikes. We're trying to pedal away from it and go up these hills faster than it. And we go down these hills. And then we finally get to the point we – it's a long story. It, I, it probably takes 20 minutes to get through every little detail. And I've actually done a podcast episode just of this story <laughs> um, with, like, animations and sounds and stuff. That was, like, four years ago. I'll have to share it with you. Yeah. And we'll we have go to drop that in the, the show woods. notes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll drop it in the show notes. But I we bail the, on the bikes right around sunset in northern Canada – which is it's the Wait, middle so of it's summer. It's still chasing by this point. you, at, and you're you're like done for the day. Like you're trying to stop. Yeah, we're done. We're done. <laughs> it's about to be okay. dark, but it's like nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night because the sun, you know, doesn't set. It sets really late in northern Canada, or it doesn't set at all in you know Alaska in the middle of summer. But still, it was you know super late. We're hiding in the woods, super thick, and we're like, okay, this, we you know we got away from it, and so we start <laughs> setting up our tent, and then. We walk back to our, I mean, it's the thickest woods you can imagine. You kind of like move around the trees and, and like you couldn't see for more than like 10 feet in front of you. There were so many trees and really close together. And uh, we couldn't even find a place to put our tent down. But this is after all this chasing, going through a ghost. We were supposed to have a resupply that wasn't there. It was a terrible day. Um, we set our tent up, walk back to the bikes, come back to the tent. We look up and right next to our tent is that bison. And his tongue's hanging out because it's been running for two hours. Um, it's like, <laughs> and it looks like it's just about to kill us. And I'm frozen. My buddy's frozen. And then without any warning, it just takes off running right past us. And we're like hiding behind the trees and like, oh my God, here it is. It's, it's like, this is it. This is it. And then it just runs past us through the woods, crashing through trees, finds its way to the road and we could hear its hoofs just click, clack, click, clack on the asphalt till it's out of earshot. And we just had to go to sleep at that point. So it was, <laughs> we were so freaked out and oh, it was all kinds of stuff like that. We had grizzly bears come up to our tent on a handful of nights, sniff the tent, scratch the tent. Um, that could have just with, you know, just the decision could have just open the tent, you know, scratched it open, bitten it open and killed us. There's nothing we could do. We had no protection, no weapons. Uh, I remember when we crossed the border into Canada, I mean, we were so green. We looked so green, like uh, so, totally unprepared and inexperienced. Um, the Border Patrol, Canadian Border Patrol said, do you all have any weapons on you? You know, guns, knives, anything. And we said, no. And he's like, nothing? And I said, no, Uh <laughs> He goes, well, you should have something because <laughs> I think he was, I thought he was going to say, well, you got to, we're going to confiscate it. He's like, no, he goes, go to your local, go to the store in town and get some bear spray. And we get to town and a bottle of bear spray is like 50 bucks. And we're like, man, forget that. That's like three weeks out here. You're like, what are you talking about? So we bought a can of wasp spray. I was just going to and... say that. I thought, like, I bet you bought wasp spray. <laughs> and what's funny is we bought like the, or, you know, eco-friendly wasp spray. Uh, I, I think that was all they had. It was like, you know, Canada is so expensive. It was probably like 10 bucks. And uh, <laughs> it sprayed, I bet it sprayed like vinegar. You know, it was the most mundane stuff. A dog actually chased us across a, a Native American reservation in Montana. And we sprayed that wasp spray in its eyes. That spray hit that dog right in the eyes. And that dog, it didn't even flinch. It just kept running. And then we come to a stop. And the dog's actually super friendly. Uh, and he just thought we like dropped some water on it or something. It didn't bother that dog at all. So this, I mean, imagine what it, you know, what it would have done to a, a grizzly bear. It was, so yeah. we felt pretty terrible about the dog, gave it some food. And it was like, had no clue we tried to hurt it. <laughs> but yeah, man, that's... that was probably one of the most unexpected things. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, that is hilarious. I've, I, it really reminds me of a, of a personal story that I've had with, with a dog, not with a bison. But, yeah, <clears throat> I'd be interested to hear what a biologist has to say about the bison's behavior because that, that is – I mean, you're talking about like – I'm a sportsman, right? And so I, I see a lot of animals and I, and I love to observe animals. And, and they're not built to cover distances the same, right? They have – they can run super fast for short amounts of time, a lot of them. You know, some can, can like, like you look at like a caribou, right? Like a caribou can just walk all day long and somehow eat while they're walking three miles an hour. But like, not, there's very rarely you find any that can just jog for an hour, right? Like just yeah. straight without them, like 
getting in a bad position for themselves, right? So that is that is really interesting. And I don't know enough about bison in particular, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear. I, when you, I when studied you biology, to. but uh, you know, I, I call myself the world's dumbest biologist um, because I just like I love it, but I don't remember anything, and so. Um, I, I call myself a snap biologist where I'm like, I'm looking at an animal or, or, a, or a plant. I'm like, oh, that's a, uh, gosh, what is that? That's a, I don't know, but it's pretty cool, isn't it? That's pretty cool. So <laughs> just, just point it out. <laughs> I'm like, that's that. I can't, I can't remember what it's called, but it's really cool. That's a cool thing. Um, so, awesome. yeah, man. Well, I want to yeah, yeah. pull this back really quick because I, I know I've got to let you go here. But, um we talked a little bit about, about food for a second. And it's always amazing to me what the human body can adapt to, right? Like you guys are pedaling like 80 miles a day. Right. And, and, you know, I know it's all downhill from Alaska, right? It's up there on the top of the world, just coast down. (laughs) But, but, uh, but no, in all seriousness, like, like people are out there doing these through hikes and they're eating trash, right? Like they're eating maybe a little bit of peanut butter with a, with a, jelly, you know, gummy bear in there or something, you know, and, and just the weirdest stuff, but the body adapts. And I mean, it's, it's the best flex fuel machine there is out there where you can feed it any, just such a, a wide variety of things, but the body always adapts. And I think that's always interesting. And when I think about the conversations you've likely had with so many people doing so many amazing things, people walking around the world, people doing, you know, all these different and and not the typical, right? Like the typical is like, all right, I'm going to jump on the AT. I'm going to hike it. Right. And that's not typical, but like compared to the people you interview, that sounds a little more common. Um, so I, it, it amazes me. And I'd love to hear, I guess, your perspective on the body's ability to adapt, whether that's food or maybe whether that's just some of these other people you've interviewed that have that have just been able to do feats that you don't feel like should be humanly possible. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the body, I'm blown away by people's confidence to just go out or like their ability to say, I'm just going to face the ocean or these, the snow or these elements. And, um, yeah, there was a few times on those trips I've run out of food and that's a horrible feeling. I'm actually pretty, I play, I, but like on a day hike, I bring way too much food now just because I, I, I hated that feeling of like not having an option to like, you're just hungry. Um, it was horrible. And I feel for anybody going through that, but yeah, I'm not the most, most, you know, sort of my diet, it can fluctuate quite, quite, quite a bit. And on an adventure, I kind of let anything go, um, which isn't, I don't know the norm now in a lot of ways, but yeah, your body can adapt so, so well, uh, you know, obviously, if you don't feed it good things, you know, it, it, it's not going to perform at its best uh, over time. It can definitely wear on you. But in a pinch or if that's just uh, what you get it used to, um, there's a lot of people that can do a lot with very little. And I'm, I'm blown away by the folks that can pack so little uh, good food but, but small amounts and, and make it work for these long, long experiences. Um but yeah, your body uh, also gets in shape really quickly. Uh, we we could only I, people we, we were trying to shoot for eighty miles a day, and at first it was like difficult to get forty because we did no training. By the way, we both played basketball at this college together, so we had we were like, oh, you know, we're college athletes, you know, we're going to be fine. And uh, you know, as you know, certain muscle groups and endurance does not translate well to other sports. You know, you, just because you're a great runner doesn't mean you can swim really well and vice versa. Uh, but so we really neglected the training. And so our first, I think our only our second ride was on the route itself. We didn't know how to change flat tires. We didn't know anything. Uh, we just went (laughs) and, uh, yeah, so it was really hard to get 40 miles in those first days, but within gosh, a month we could hit a hundred miles every day easily. And people were telling us that that was going to happen. And we were like, there's no way. How, how is that? How does that happen? But every day you could sense that you could go farther and farther. And anybody that runs, they know that, you know, you can tire out in a quarter mile uh, on your first time running or a hundred yards even. But by the end of a week, you can usually like you can do a mile. And by the end of two weeks, you can do six and they, I mean, you can really scale up 
very quickly and your body uh, can get in shape a lot faster than people realize. Um, I'm by no means in like great shape, but uh, I know that I can get that. I can get in good shape in a relatively short amount of time if needed. But um, yeah, man, the body is an amazing thing. Uh, but a few things before we leave. I don't know if you got any other questions. I do want to make sure folks uh, get out there, make adventures happen. Like one thing we talk about on our show a lot after 900 episodes, and, and folks I like to talk to is like, don't let gear stop you. Don't let the lack of it stop you. Like you can upgrade gear over time as you get better and as you figure out what you want. But if all you've got is stuff from Walmart or stuff you borrowed from your mom's friend's cousin from 20 years ago, go with that. You know, as long as it's not going to put you in danger, go with what you got with the amount of time you have and just get out there. Even if it is, I do not neglect going camping after work and coming back home the next morning. That Those kinds of experiences are so meaningful to me. They break up the monotony and it has every element of a big adventure packed into a small little little time frame and you get all that benefit. Now it might not last as long, but you can also do that on a more, much more frequent basis. So I get a lot of folks on these shows that do much bigger, multiple year long experiences. I've got one lady who's been exploring Patagonia by horseback for like 30 years, uh, just a 30 year adventure, um, finding food and finding ways to make money along the way. I've had other, my, my longest trip was six months. My shortest is, the ones I do now that are three days long, really two and a half. And I fit them on the weekends and I do four or five a year with friends. Um, there may be one day in the future I do a longer trip again, but I, I, I don't know. It just fits for my lifestyle right now. And I'm happy talking to people that are doing those big ones and seeing what they learn from it. Um, but we've had so many amazing stories over the years. We don't focus on one sport. We have backpacking and sailing and uh, – Gosh, um, camping experts, people who have ridden a camel across Australia, um, people who sailed around the world by themselves, people who climb tons of mountains or just hitchhike, you know, like all these specialties and and unique experiences. That's who we try to talk to, quirky people doing quirky adventures and just seeing what they got out of it. Yeah, I think think the interesting and big takeaway from that with, would be that as humans, we're interested in fascination. Like we're fascinated with, with interesting things or unique things, right? So, so of course, interviewing someone who's, I don't know, sailed around the world on a one-person sailboat or something like that. I don't know that you have interviewed someone like that, but you probably have. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's only been like five people to do it. And I had one of them on the show, probably two of them actually. Yeah, two. <laughs> so like as humans, though, we're fascinated to hear about that and to – learn about that story. Like we're fascinated, right? But, um, the only comparison in our life worth doing is comparing our stuff, our self from the past to our self today, right? Like looking at mm-hmm. your own self. If you are like, that's the only valuable comparison there really is like, are you may, are you improving your own life? And so I love listening and I love interviewing people that have done some of these crazy trips, like 5,000 miles, um, coming down from Alaska. But if you are listening, you don't have to have the world's best gear. And that's coming from a gear company, right? You don't have to yeah, have sorry the about world's that. best gear. <laughs> no, because we take we say it all the time is that half of what we because we're our purpose is to connect people with the vital outdoors. And yeah. half of that can be gear, but the other half of that is sheer knowledge, experience, eliminating variables, eliminating people's fears, and helping them have confidence to go with whatever gear they can get their hands on, right? So we we're not different in, in what you just said. Um, of course, the more you go, the more you slowly yeah. want you to get invest started with what you in. have. Yeah. You will, you, once you do have quality gear, you'll never go back. Um, I've run into that. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like maybe vital outdoors is almost not aspirational. Maybe it is an aspirational where it's like, all right, I'm going to get myself to the point where that I can, that makes sense to what I can have, but that good quality gear will last you so long. Um, yeah. So yeah, but, but, I, I mean, it took me a while to get to the point where I could even afford stuff like what y'all have, and and but that that stuff lasts a while, and uh, does make it more doable and more comfortable, even. So, yeah, but to to wrap that back back into it, I would just say like 
I love listening and learning from all these fascinating people. People have so much knowledge, but wherever you're at, whether you're like, Hey, I wanted to go do my first overnighter or I want to do, or maybe you're joining us for the OV 100 challenge and you're doing your first hundred miles, um, this summer, like, like only compare yourself and your value and what you get out of an experience based off of your own experiences. You don't have to, to go through hike, you know, you don't have to go do the AT to, to do something of, of importance or value or whatever. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there because we love interviewing fascinating people and I love all of that, but, um, never judge yourself. Just go be, just go to your own adventures. Right. Like, I think that's, what's so cool about the podcast you run Mason is that, um, people are doing their own adventures and they're, they're absolutely wild and they're, they're just creating them out of thin air. A lot of them, no one ever, you know, has competitions about who can walk around the world the fastest or whatever. Like someone just decided I was going to walk around the world. Right. So, yeah. Which we've had (laughs) plenty of those too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, I've got to let you go, Mason. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and I feel like we're going to definitely have to do a part two here because, um, you've got a wealth of stories. You've got a wealth of experience that, that, um, I feel like we just, just were getting into. So I know um, thanks I'm so again. sorry. It takes an hour, honestly, to really get into any interview I find. And, uh, yeah, man, I've got so many stories that I'd never get to tell because I'm always interviewing others. So always happy to come on, but thank you so much. Sorry, I got to run. Let's do a part two, and I'll send you the Buffalo story in the meantime. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll drop that in the show notes, and uh, we'll let you go. Thanks again, Mason. All right. See you, Tyson. Tyson, whatever it was. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Um, really enjoyed some of the stories we got into there. And again, I think we'll have to bring Mason back for a part two. Um, you can follow Mason, though, over on the Adventure Sports Podcast. Uh, where it's a very it's a very long running podcast with a lot of episodes, so there's a ton of content to even go backwards and listen through. But big thanks to Mason for coming on. Um, I also wanted to take a quick second to just remind you guys that you still can sign up for the OV100 Challenge. We had a massive amount of people sign up for it this year. We're really excited about that. And by the time this podcast rolls out, we'll likely be starting maybe the first uh, week of that training program. But you can jump on at any time. Um, and, and be a part of that. We have a late registration sign up. So highly encourage you guys to do that, to make sure that you guys go and have an amazing adventure this year. That's what this is about is us helping to motivate you, you getting inside of the the Facebook group and, and just pushing each other to make sure you guys go and execute an amazing trip this summer. Um, it's been a valuable tool. The feedback was amazing last year and really excited to, to help coach and to help motivate, Um, inside of that group. So please go join us. You can still sign up today under the late registration for the OV 100 mile challenge. Um, If you have any questions for us, reach out to us at live ultralight podcast at Gmail. Make sure to drop a comment on YouTube. If you're over listening on YouTube. Um, And if you have not yet reviewed rated and reviewed this podcast, please, please do so. It means the world to us and it really does help this podcast grow and help us reach more people and impact more lives and helping with our mission to connect more people to the vital outdoors with that, make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you guys on a future episode.